Hello, Finland. My first lush. This is so cool. Have you guys seen the saunas yet? This place is amazing. <laughs> they said um, 9 billion people, 2050. It seems like we screwed, man. Like, I don't know if there's hope for this. How can we possibly feed that many people? <laughs> yeah, we're probably screwed. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, here's all we're hopefully here to talk about, you know, some solutions that we're trying to bring to the market through what these guys are doing and also what we're investing in, so. Food is part of what your fund do, Horizons, Horizon Ventures, uh, among other things. What is the opportunity that you see today in the food space? Yeah, so I think food is a huge space, you know. I mean, when we talk about food, we're talking about nutrition, we're talking about sustenance, we're talking about... Uh, uh, survival, right? And so uh, looking at the different trends, I guess, of, of the past five to 10 years, one is that, you know, we have a crisis of, of not being able to feed as many people as, as uh, the world is going to have in 2050. Um, one is health trends, right? People want to eat healthier, they want to be healthier, uh, they want to take health and wellness into their own hands, right, and, and control that. Three is food security, right? I mean, we think there's a lot of, uh, we, we're thinking a very big global problem, but you know, regionally, there are people just who can't get food, who can't get clean food, clean water. Uh, in you know, Asia, so, you have specific challenges there in that market, right, that you can absolutely, tackle? Absolutely, absolutely. Like, I mean, China, for example, you know, uh, uh, people five years ago were still drinking beer instead of water because they couldn't get clean water. So. Uh, that ex extends to protein, that extends to vegetables, that extends to all parts of our diet. So, I, I, you know, I think it's a very, from an investor perspective, it's a very defensible uh, thesis. So the space is active. There's a lot of investment in that space. What it is that's being invested on when we say that it's active, how it has been active already? So a lot of people have been investing in alternative protein. So that has been, you know, kind of, I guess, a hot topic in the last two, three years. A uh, big part of the reason for that is because people are going along this a little bit of a doomsday crisis that we're going to run out of protein. And so, you know, how are we going to replace that and how are we going to leverage other technologies and other parts of, I guess, a food system to replace, you know, beef and, and pork and chicken, right? Um, there's a lot has been done in the logistics of delivery, the log how do you actually get food to people uh, outside of the brick and mortar grocery retail, uh, uh, you know, kind of habit that we have today. Uh, E-commerce has played a big part in that. Uh, and then it's, you know, how do we get fresh food that is, you know, traceable, reliable? Uh, how do we get food that, you know, is responsibly grown and responsibly uh, farmed, right? So, so that has been, you know, a big part of that. And that a, lot of, a, lot, of a lot of us have noticed that, like that disruption of distribution and that disrup disrup disruption of production. But one of the things that we talked about opportunities on the table, left on the table, uh, it's a topic that you brought it up that I really love. It's the whole possibility on personalized, right? Right. Making it about you. How do you see it that? It yeah. Can so happen? that's that's like you know sort of one step ahead, right? I mean. We want food to be healthier for us. We want food that is better for the environment. But at the end of the day, we don't want, we don't want to be eating the same food as, as everybody else because we need to be special now. <laughs> you know? and, and, but that's, you know, I think there's... And that connects to the revolution in health that we're going through right now, the whole notion that it's Correct. all about... Well, because we're able to... We have more data now. We exactly. know that we're different. We know that our guts are different. Our microbiomes are different. We know that... Um, you know, racially we're different because of, you know, culture and, and weather and everything. So uh, it does make sense. It does make sense. And then I, but I guess the question is, uh, provocatively, you know, do we really need to live that long? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, because that, that's another set of problems. If we do live longer, we are healthier, you know, then we will have less and less. Uh, we'll have more and more of a problem uh, of, of, you know, more and more people in this world, which is a good thing. So if you invest in Orion, perfect day, non-dairy milk. What the hell do you mean by non-dairy milk? <laughs> I mean that we're developing a new way for the world to make dairy proteins and dairy in general that's based on fermentation instead of animal farming. And it all started with you. I, I like that journey a lot because your journey has to do with my journey. You were trying to be vegan and you kind of gave up. I completely gave up. Like, forget that. Can we curse here at the slush? Is that okay? Like, fuck that. It's not happening. <laughs> 
So tell me about that journey and the epiphany that you got that brought you to a perfect day. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would say that I gave up per se, but I, I know what you're getting at. And basically, on my journey, I grew up eating meat and, and dairy and all you know, normal, real foods made from animals. And I, like many people in our generation, started learning about some of the externalities associated with how we farm today. And it led me to desire to change the footprint I was having. And so around the beginning of college, I went vegetarian, which isn't terribly hard today. There are plenty of options, and it, it doesn't feel like you're giving up too much. Um, but eventually, I, I started to realize that eggs and dairy are part of the same problematic system as, as meat in terms of the, the carbon footprint and water use and land use and animal welfare, all these different things that we're concerned about. And so I started to realize that I, I wasn't really doing all that I could. And so I, I made the sort of much more painful transition to trying to be totally vegan, where now you're not eating any meat or eggs or dairy or any animal products. Um, and that, that's a lot more difficult. So it feels like all the food that you're eating now is made out of glue instead of food. And, and I think that speaks a little bit to the old school and, way. And you try like soy milk and Yeah, all those milk. sort of things, right? And the, the plant-based milks are typically not very high in protein. And to, to give it a, a milk-like texture, they're adding things like starches and stabilizers and, and emulsifiers and things that you really don't want in your food. Um, and that's, that's doubly true in derivative dairy products like your yogurts and cheeses and ice creams, in order to give that kind of creaminess and mouthfeel, the best they can do is to put starches in, basically. And that, that didn't feel good enough to me, and, and it made me feel like I wasn't eating something that had proper nutrition, because as you might know, dairy protein is the most nutritious protein known in the world. And so you're missing that when you eat vegan dairy products. And so the, the question I had was, first of all, can't, is there a better way to be doing this? And second of all, if it's so difficult to, to be vegan and to eat these other products, if I'm having such a hard time and I care so much about it, no wonder no one else is doing it. And we're never going to hit that critical mass of adoption that we really need to actually change the world. So it ends up feeling more like self-torture than actually something that can address the problems you're concerned with. And so, so at the time... So you started looking, someone looked, uh, there was something in that space, and did yeah, you look, so, um, where, did, where have you looked? So the, could you repeat the question? What do you mean? I, where have you looked? Like, if there was something in that space, like for you to start right. perfect day? So, so the, the way we thought about it was, what's missing from these products and what would really change the world for, for the better in terms of dairy is if we were able to make these proteins without animals, because animals are the very kind of beginning of the supply chain and the reason that all these problems exist. So how do you make animal protein without animals? That was the question. And I remember I had that thought. I was working at the time in biomedicine where I was making antibodies and other therapeutics, which are animal proteins made without animals. So it's this aha moment. I'm, I'm thinking, this technology is already there. It's already 50 years old. No one's taken it. Well, at first, I didn't realize that no one had done it. So I looked it up. Um, I'm in, it's 2014 at the time, and I'm thinking, every idea has already been had, right? There's nothing new under the sun. But when I looked it up, Nothing. It's not like people are writing articles about how, what a great idea, but it's impossible because of X, Y, Z reasons. No one's ever thought of it. So rather than apply to work as an entry-level employee at one company that I would like to, there was just no company to work for. So instead, we took it upon ourselves, my co-founder and I, to start the company to do so exactly that. So what stage that. are you now? Is this something that we're going to see in the markets tomorrow? Or are we going to be able to buy this shit and try it out? Like, when can I try it? Yeah, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of rushing in this industry, and we're not here to rush through it. We want to do it right. And so it does take a little bit of time to scale up this technology. We have a team of 25 people, mostly scientists and, and people with biological expertise, based in Berkeley, California. And we're working with food companies, big and small, to bring our, our technology to market as quickly as we can, but also not just with one product. We want to do this in a way that we can really help the whole industry. And one thing we learned on our journey is that it's not just about fresh dairy products like cheese and yogurt and ice cream, which maybe were my obsession at the beginning, but it turns out that dairy proteins lend functionality to products all over the grocery store. So if we zoom out a little bit and take more of an ingredient-centric approach, we can actually have impact that's, that's much, much broader. And so that's, that's what we're working on now with, with many different partners. And, and I'm sorry, one last thing here. It, it, it sounds incredible, dairy, non-dairy uh, non milk, uh, the protein chase that you after sounds healthy, but it doesn't sound delicious. So how are you tackling that notion that a lot that the way we perceive food and the way we enjoy food is about the taste and about the look and feel? Yeah, so that's exactly why we're doing this, right? We, we care about, and what I care about personally, is that delicious, indulgent experience of dairy products that is missing today if you try to, you know, 
have products that aren't made from cows. And I can tell you exactly why it feels unappetizing to think about. It does. Because <laughs> in, for, for centuries, and certainly in the last century, making something in a new way meant using harsh chemicals and, and synthetic things and, and just totally, for example, vegan dairy products today, which literally taste like they have nail polish remover in Yucky. them sometimes. They're totally <laughs> gross. But this is 21st century now. When we, when we manufacture a new product, when we're thinking about the whole new supply chain, we're making it exactly the same way that cows make it, but with that biology in a better organism than a cow. So the protein that we're making is the exact same protein that your body is already familiar with. Pure protein has no flavor, so it can take on whatever product it goes in. You can put it in a tomato soup to have more protein, like dairy protein is already doing today, mm -hmm. but you can also use it as a base to craft a whole new kind of non-dairy products that the world's never seen before and those will be appetizing. So in your journey right now, you continue to pursue that, and that's one of the stages that you are, you add, as well as the other things that you're tackling. But your stuff already tastes delicious. Yes, it does, thank you. <laughs> so Ben, how about agriculture? Like, why agriculture? What, I beg your pardon? Why agriculture, you know? To, so, yeah, great to question. So many um, things to disrupt uh, out there. And that, and that, a whole bunch of points that I think <laughs> I'm, I'm desperate to make on, on, on the comments that we've already heard. My dad was an environmental barrister, so I grew up in a household where we were just quite well versed in a lot of the harm that was being done to the environment, um, in the way that we produce food. Um, and I don't think we're screwed at all, actually. I think that if we can use new technology to go back to the symbiotic system that existed before about 60 years ago, then, there's, then, then we're, in a, we're in a good place. All the technology is there. It's now just a case of bringing people towards it. And this is, I guess, relevant to some of the comments that we've heard already. You, I don't believe you can persuade consumers to give up anything. You can't persuade them to give up on taste. On, mm. You can't persuade them to pay more. You have to use new technology to create products and services that are simply better than the ones that they're, they're trying to replace. So in the example of agriculture, an organic grass-fed leg of lamb, and, and there's nothing I believe we can do to stop people eating lamb, so I think our role should be to actually say, okay, well, how do we, how do we have a, a, a food production system which is kind to the environment and animal welfare? We have to create a system where that leg of lamb which will just be outright better than any of the nasty industrial stuff that's being produced. Um, and, and that's really what's driving our, our business forward. It's, it's, it's predominantly veg and fruit and milk and bread and eggs. It's, it's across the whole range. But so tell me a little bit about it. How does it work? Yeah, great. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we've built a, a, a platform of four mobile products. So at, at one end, you've got hundreds of farmers who are all getting real-time orders directly from consumers at the other end. And then we've got two other mobile products which are facilitating the logistics. So we're effectively directly connecting local sustainable producers with people who want to eat amazing fresh food, and we're, and we're doing it real time uh, and zero waste. So every single bag of spinach which we take receipt of has actually been ordered by a customer. And that waste thing is massively important, mm. because guess what? The UN are telling us that a third of all the food that we produce globally is actually going in the bin. That is so fucked up. Well, it is, because it means that if we can actually s make the, the system more efficient and stop throwing the food in the bin, then actually we don't have the Malthusian crisis, which the likes of Syngenta would have us believe in order for them to sell all of their fertilizers and pesticides, which are really, really bad news. So with Farm Drop, you're creating that on-demand production feel. And it's funny, like, you know, you guys know I work in fashion, and people are like, why are you moderating your food conversation? A lot of what we do in fashion is being inspired by what's being done in food. So on on-demand production, what you're tackling, it's something that we're tackling in, in fashion world right now. So on, on that note, how, how do you get the onboarding of the, uh, of the farmers? It seems to me like a fucking nightmare. Any business and many startups in the audience today have to do with onboarding small business owners to use your product. How could you do yeah. that at scale? And it sounds like a lot of friction. And, so, so it, and it, was, it was. It was a complete nightmare. And I mean, the, the business has been going for over four years now. So we've got literally hundreds of farmers. And there's zero churn. Like every farmer who comes onto the platform, they stay, they stay. And they love it. And the reason that they love it is actually an economic one. We give them 75% of the retail price, 
which is roughly 2x what they would get elsewhere. Why? Because it's a disintermediated food system. We spend half the money moving the food between them and the actual customer, and we give the gains equally to the consumer in terms of great price points and, produ and producers in terms of three quarters of the retail price. And that's what enabled us to say, look, come and join this mad hat scheme because the economics are amazing. So we, we used the economics to bring the best food producers on the platform, and, and, and that's really what drives that. We have no outbound producer sales marketing at all now. So let me ask you one challenge here. It sounds amazing, just like Ryan, sounds amazing. Um, I get my, my fresh food, I get it fast. Um, it tastes better because I got it faster. But it sounds expensive, man. Like this yeah. whole proposition seems like you asking me to pay a lot more. And just like in fashion, when you want to do things sustainably, we wonder, do consumers really give a damn enough to pay more? Um, no, I, I, I totally agree. <laughs> this is massively important, this point. I think it's fantasy. It just doesn't give me out of bed in the morning, this idea that we're going to sell amazing food to a tiny number of really rich people. Like, that doesn't solve anything. Um, so we look at our price comparisons all the time. And guess what? We're in line with the supermarkets, if you look at their closest comparable products with, with what we're selling. But ours are always unequivocally higher quality. And that's what our customers say. It's just like, the, 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 that cauliflower is just off the chart. It's just better. I've never seen anything like that in the supermarket. And how are we able to do that? comes back to this whole point about using mobile tech to disintermediate so we can operate at a much lower margin. For a c consumer, that just means a lower markup. And, that, and that's, again, what drives retention on the customer side, because they feel like they genuinely are getting a great value proposition. And in the UK, are you getting out soon? Can, I, can we yeah, get Yeah, touch wood, yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a VC trap. I think that the international <laughs> expansion thing, if you go too soon, it's a, it's, a, it's a trap, and you've got to get... Penetration. In, in something like food logistics, you've got to get your unit economics so on point and make it all perfect, reliability perfect. And added to which, it's just a huge, huge domestic market. So you can create a very big business by doing it really well in one marketplace. So we will get there, but, you know, <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to get the timing right we'll on these things. We'll be waiting, we'll be waiting. So Chris and Ryan, Ben talked about waste. Waste really freaks me out. Like, and you guys know, you all flown here, those who don't live here, you're watching that scene on the plane, so many trays, so much food just being dumped, a lot of stuff even unwrapped being dumped. That's our world today, a world of absolute waste. Do you think about waste? Do you seek um, ideas in that space? Have you saw anything interesting? Can you tackle that in your, with your company somehow? You know, I think <clears throat> it's a, uh this is a socioeconomic problem, right? It's a social cultural problem. I mean, I don't think as an investor I can necessarily solve that. I can look at business models that have the ability to, uh, to change at least the supply chain. But it's hard for me to change whether, you know, Ryan always wastes food, he doesn't. But like, if he always wastes food, it's hard. I mean, I can only tell him not to do it. And I have to do that starting from school and saying, don't waste food, don't waste food, and then restaurants are going to say, oh, we're wasting a lot of food, and it's an economic issue, and then they'll change. I don't get it. They're throwing money away by not getting efficient processes I mean, you're in, in fashion, place. okay? So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, when we talk about real economic ways... No, I'm okay. No, no, but, you know, I think, I think it's everybody values things differently, right? And so uh, having the ability to sit at a restaurant to have a huge piece of steak just to take a picture of, and then eating half of that is real. I mean, people do that nowadays all the time. And so uh, that's why I think investing in food biotechnology and in related uh, food agriculture tech, then you, you know, as an investor, you have to work with the whole ecosystem. You have to work with NGOs, you have to work with influencers, you have to work with people who uh, are doing a lot of great things in the school kind of cafeteria and, and change behavior that way. And there are all, there are all these different pathways to do it. And I think uh, you know, that's a, a, part, I mean, a part of the solution maybe. Are you going to be able to get a waste angle uh, for, for your for perfect day? I think so. If you think about it, so much of the science and technology of how we understand food spoilage comes from milk. It's, it's one of the most sure. bacteria-laden products out of, right out of the farm that, that we know of. So things like pasteurization and, and ultra-high temperature processing and things like that were really developed for dairy. And I think there's a couple angles by which we can help this. On the one hand, the, the very core first product we're making, the protein itself, 
is much cleaner than anything you could hope to get from an animal farm. So right out of the gate, you're just starting with less bacteria. And, and that's, you know, that's one part of it. But I think also, part of why we talk about the functionality of so much that milk proteins bring to food is because, for example, there's something, I don't know if anyone here has had those ultra-high temperature pasteurized milks, the kind that don't need refrigeration, and they mm -hmm. taste really weird, right? Mm -hmm. they have, actually, some countries, people like that flavor, but most, most of us don't like that caramelly, weird kind of taste of that shelf-stable milk, but actually, we understand what the proteins are doing to cause that flavor, and it's easy enough for people using our kind of technology to not have that happen. So now all of a sudden you can do high temperature pasteurization without any weird flavors coming out of it. And it just becomes easier to make totally shelf stable products and also ship powder instead of water weight. So much of what we're shipping and, and all that mass that's moving around on, on freight trains and ships and everything is water that milk is 88% water, right? But if there are better ways of working with powdered versions and ingredients of dairy, that's actually where most of our milk goes. I think more than two-thirds of the milk that we produce in the world is turned into other products and used as ingredients. And so why aren't we doing more of that and treating, you know, that's where the impact happens, right? It's a little bit like how people tell you in, in California, where I live, there's, there's a major drought kind of all the time. And so they say, okay, turn off the tap while you brush your teeth or, or something like that. And I always get the feeling that those consumer changes are not where the problem actually is, right? I mean some factory somewhere runs for one less minute, and that does so much more than everyone in the whole city, right? Or something like that. And so similarly, I think when we look at the industry and when we zoom out a little bit and look at where all these products are actually moving and, and actually how this works, you can have a lot more change happen by, by doing it there rather than all the way at the end consumer, if So that here makes to sense. wrap it up, there's a lot of technologies out there in the market today that captures our imagination, but they're not gonna hit sooner than five years from now. Like me, grown, uh, lab-grown meat, it's being developed, but it's not consumer ready and won't be for a while. The same way that lab-grown uh, leather has been in production for over five years. What is it that we are gonna see near term, like near future, even beyond what you are building? What do you predict that us consumers, investors, uh, people that watch the space, disruptions that we're gonna see hit the market next year and become real conversations? the next couple of years? Well, I, I think we, we, we always look at the food space as what ends up in your plate, right? And so lab-grown meat and that conversation and tissue engineering, uh, synthetic biology, I mean, all of these is, this is real technology, right? And, and I think we don't look at the less sexy side of things, which is flavors, you know, colors, uh, ingredients, right? I mean, all of that can be very much in the system already in a cost-effective way. Um, and so do I think you know, we will be able to have everything that's you know, biotech driven and you know, on our plates tomorrow? Probably not, but you, know, you will have something that you eat that will be coming from a biotechnology perspective uh, you know, probably in the next two, three years. So biotechnology for you, quickly, what do you think? I, I agree with Al Gore. I think we are right at the cusp of a sustainability revolution mm. and it's being driven by people wanting to eat healthier, and e eating healthier, I, th I think, by and large, means eating in a way that's ecologically better. So that it's already going. It's, it's than already food, going. Right? It's hitting every verb. Totally. This it's the same system. For sustainability. And it's accelerating. I'm very hopeful. I'm excited about that too. You're right. What do you think is the theme for the next couple of years? Well, when you have a hammer, all problems appear as nails. And you all know my hammer is biotechnology. So I would agree with Chris. I think, and, and I really like your point too, Chris, that a lot of it is invisible to us. But for example, like today, uh, or as of a few years ago, the only places to get vanilla flavor were from forests in Madagascar or petroleum, right? And that's, that's my earlier point. Petroleum was the new way to make it. And no one likes that, right? So now there's a new way using biotechnology, and it's the same exact ingredient, and it performs the same way, but all of a sudden it's cheaper, it's better for the environment. And healthier. Right? So we have to remain open-minded to these kind of things, because it might not look the way you expect, but it's the right move for the future because this is a big problem. And to Al Gore's point, I mean, we, are, we can do this if we embrace the, the opportunities that are in front of us. Oh, thanks for the Al Gore plug. He was great today. He was amazing. We are out of time. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. Thank you all for listening, watching. Thank you, Slush. This is an awesome event. Thanks. Enjoy. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, Liz.